Welcome to another chapter of the Crown podcast. On the Crown podcast, we like to create environments that feel safe. Environments that feel comforting, warm, pleasant to be in. We like the frequency to feel holistic and soothing and good for your well-being. When we look around online and in this world, we can often see disaster, stressful environments, and overwhelm. And when creating the Crown brand and the Crown products, it was very intentional of me to kind of own a tiny corner in this space where it's free from all of those things. And... In this chapter, we are joined by an extraordinary being, someone who I look up to. She radiates so much beauty through her art, a poetic frequency of love, her writing, films, the way of being. Um, It just inspires hundreds of thousands of people every single day. Um, Doing some research, some of the words that her fans and supporters use to describe her and her work are authentic warm, soothing, deep, comforting, and that her message is real. It's relatable, it's prophetic, and it goes straight to the heart. Lisa Marie, also known as Seasoned Dialogue, welcome to the Crown podcast. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) The pleasure is ours. And for a long while, people have been sending me your work. So just checking out your work and I was just like, wow, the most glaring thing is the tone of your work. It's very, it's very soft and it's comforting as the word I um, I mentioned that through my research, people have used to describe you as comforting, but there's also a polarity to it that's quite raw and real and you touch on topics that are quite heavy, you know? And so the balance between that soft and gentle, um, vulnerable, and that raw, intense wilderness, I've been through some things. Um, It doesn't flow out of you in anger. I'm sure it could. It doesn't flow out of you with resentment or bitterness or jealousy. I'm sure you've had more than enough reason to to acting that way, but it comes out of you so purely. And I just want to know, first of all, um, have you always been this way? Um, And do you make a conscious effort of maintaining that frequency of calm? Mm. Um, I will say that I've always been this way. Um, I think that the way that people receive it is just the way that I have learned to be as a woman. Um, It's the reflection of how I would want someone to speak to me. So, you know, while other people's um, messages could be raw, loud, and real, and you could still get it, um, I often... And I'll be honest, you know, for me, I am a sensitive being. So anything loud and raw, I have a little trepidation. (laughs) So for me, I I speak it the way that I want to receive it and just the way that I am. I mean, you know, that is part of um, being authentic that I just I feel like it's a part of me. So, yeah. When I mentioned, or it's likely that you have every reason to not be that kind of person based on the things that you've been through and the experiences that you've had, you you giggled. (laughs) Um, So I sense there's some truth to that. And, And I guess part of the journey is, I guess, knowing how to control yourself and not act out emotionally. Um... But what does that look like for you, you know, when you are wronged or when you go through a a difficult time, maintaining that sacred space of calm? 
I have had a lot of experiences. Um, you know, <laughs> life will present you with a lot of things. And I think that the um, the biggest example of what I didn't want to be was what my mother shown me. She wasn't great with, um, she wasn't great with stress. She wasn't great when it came to problematic things um, that overtook her. And so she would often just act out, you know, and that for me as a child, as a teenager, even as an adult, that scared me. Um, I I wanted to do opposite because I realized that in the way that she was behaving, it caused a lot of people to separate from her. Even though she wanted people to draw near to her, she pushed a lot of people away. And so while I was um, seeing the examples and I was looking, I made a conscious effort not to do so. So when things happen to me or that I can't, um, number one, you can't change what happened, right? We have to knowingly understand that where things happen that are beyond our control, there is nothing that we can do. Number two, um, we have to understand when it is happening to us and for us. If you just take a moment to think about that, you know, you won't get so wrapped up in your feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and then life will just present things to us that we may not understand when it initially happens, but it's always after the fact that there is an understanding. And so I just, I don't choose to live my life upset, angry at things that have happened. I, I won't fully understand, but I know that there's a meaning behind it and I'm going to be okay. I'm, I'm always thinking I'm going to be okay. And I, I end up okay. I mean, we all have moments of anger. I'm not going to say I don't get angry, but I don't allow anger to take over me <laughs> for too long. You know, I, I choose where I let that anger sit and then I proceed. And, and that place you're speaking about in many different forms of text is described or can be described as a wilderness. In many ways, the world feels like a wilderness right now. Um, where it feels as though we are on the edge of the earth and there's this pressure from the, this, the core pressing us, pressing us, pressing us. And it, it's, it's stressful, you know, for a lot of people, they have instability within their homes, within their jobs, um, within their governments, within their own mental well-being their physical well-being, emotional health. Um, it feels like the world is under a lot of pressure. And as a result, we can get caught up in that frequency, that that energy um, of stress and overwhelm, burnout. I mentioned to you beforehand that like doing this kind of work, a lot of the things we say, although they're processed quite deeply, they read quite simple. You know, the words we use, you say it, it's, it has so much more weight than just someone else saying the same thing. And then, then you will get the pushback and people will say things like, well, yes, it's easier said than done. Or, you know, it's easy for you to say because you've got it all figured out, you know, and you're successful. And what a lot of the people don't realize for people who do this kind of work, the kind of work that pause and pause and pause is coming from a place of experience. Yes. It's coming from a place of knowing the wilderness before you can speak about the wilderness. You know, it's, it's knowing the very fabrics of the emotions, living and going through them before we can identify with them with someone else. And so it does sound easy. It does sound simple. It's not a simple journey that the creator goes through to be able to pour into someone else. And so I, I kind of want to open this up today with the topic of like the wilderness, you know, the, the place that nobody wants to be in, but we all need to go through. Yes. 
when I think of the wilderness, I think of walking into a place where it's just unknown. You don't know which way to travel. You don't know which direction to take. You are depending on your own abilities and um, you're just walking blindly. You are trying to discover um, what looks good, what feels good, um, what feels you know right to your soul. You can either go straight, you can go left, you can go right. The only way that we understand or that we know is that we take a chance, you know, and by taking that chance, we will learn many lessons, you know, because we don't know, you know, um, I think when I, I think about the wilderness as well is starting off one way and ending up another way. You know, you may have taken that left turn and then you realize, oh gosh, it's a river. So maybe I need to back up and maybe I need to go to the right a little bit. And then the right gave me um, something different. But then as you journey along, you'll realize, okay, there's a little opening. Opening allows me to go a little further. And if I, you know, hit a rough spot, I can get off to the left a little bit. It's all about traveling and feeling the atmosphere, being okay with being stuck at a certain place because you don't know. We don't we don't know it all. So in order to experience what the wilderness is, we're going to have to take some detours. We're going to have to learn some lessons and we're going to have to pick up on some life uh, saving skills. There's a quote that says, you don't know how strong you are until being strong is your only option. And again, that's such a cliche Instagrammable, retweetable kind of quote. But when you live that, it hits so much deeper because there is a place where things are difficult for you and you can use willpower yes. to, to, to get through it. There's a place where things are difficult for you and you can use intellectual power to get through it. But there's a place that when you get there, it's so deep that the, the energy that it will take you to pull yourself out of it and the mental capacity needed to leave that place, that wilderness, um, you may not have in that time. And it's at th those times where your faith can be, you know, it can waver and you can feel like all hope is lost. And I think in the wilderness, um, there is a part, and I, I believe, you know, even with Jesus, you know, as he got near the end of his wilderness experience, um, you know, he wanted to tap out, you know? Yes. You know, and and the yep. temptations were there, you know, he had all these offers to like, yeah, you can free yourself, bro. You can get out of this. But, you know, there is something about the purpose of the wilderness and it overrides how you feel about it. Yes, it is. Sometimes the purpose of the wilderness overrides however you feel about the wilderness and the, the, whatever it is inside of us that lets us keep going and keep going um, that's the part that we want to tap into today you've seen a lot of transitions in your own life in your I'm sure in your friendships in your children and your family and um, even on your own self-love journey the power of seasons and identifying and having the discernment to know what is for each season. In one of your videos, you speak about grieving the person that you became in the wilderness. Um, letting go, I believe it was. And many of us stay in that survival mode and then once we overcome the storm, we still try to be the same person. Can you just break down that whole video for me and the messaging of it? You know, when we've been ourselves for so long, facets of ourselves, it becomes so familiar for us. And something just calls for us to do something different, whether it is something, you know, tragic in our life, whether you come to a crossroad, crossroads in your life, or whether you just felt the feeling to just grow. 
And when you get past that place, right, you, you go from the past self to the new self, there is a grieving process because the new self looks different. And you are still wanting to bring along the old sentiments of old selves. I um, was writing, that actually came out of a journal entry. And I remember reflecting back on, you know, just fun and being with friends and um, living life. But then realizing that I was grieving friendship, that I was growing, that they grew, that things fell apart, and that I didn't know what this meant for me. And even growing friendships, it was scary because it was like, now I'm an, I'm, I feel anew. So would this be an issue now for me and those past friends and then it didn't work out and it was okay it wasn't okay in the beginning but it ended up being okay because when you cross that threshold and you become that new person new things come as well and you see why you needed to grow so i think it's just we love those things we enjoyed those things but when something calls for us to do different and be different and act different then you have a a, a different frame of mind and you you're your actions are different and you have to almost relearn yourself and ad adjust yourself accordingly and live. And it's, it's going to be okay. You know, people will fall out. Uh, circumstances will be different. Um, seasons will definitely change. Some seasons in your life will feel longer than others. Um, but it's, it will be okay. And just as the the leaves fall off the trees and colour our floors in that beautiful shades of orange and maroon and mustard, and then you look at the, the trees and you see the bare branches and, and then it gets cold and it gets white and snowy and then the branches start forming little buds and then before you know it, you see new foliage it's the same with our lives. You know, when we go through those seasons, we there is a there's a process happening beneath the surface. There's a process happening within us. And you can't always see the fruits. But it doesn't mean that the energy that is used to bring forth those fruits isn't present just because you cannot see it. It's just beneath the surface of your heart and the wilderness and the changing of season is what starts that shift, that creation, that, that spark. A lot of people make things in their wilderness or they have great ideas in their wilderness or they, they change something about themselves in their wilderness. And mm -hmm. um, so there is a, uh, real power of going through the hard time yes oh goodness yes yes have you ever uh in your journey personally individually was there ever a time where you were going through the wilderness and you just wanted to quit and what did that look like for you and and i know you moved forward why why did you choose to move forward it's a great question. Um, there have been several times along my journey where I've wanted to quit. There have been several times along my journey where I've attempted to quit. <laughs> and so not only do I know what wanting to quit feels like, I can I also identify with what quitting feels like, you know? Um, and it was quite similar to what I described earlier. I was mentally and physically and emotionally fatigued. Emily. And for someone who creates, I need the physical energy to do the things that I do. I need the mental um, energy to be able to think through the things that I do. And the emotional part is how I have my connection with my audience. And so... If I'm depleted in all three areas, I can't show up. 
And if I can't show up, then I feel purposeless. And when I feel purposeless, that's when I want to quit. And so it was that scenario. Um, what I did is I stepped away and I came offline and um, I spent the next four years really working on myself so that those, the goal was that those things would never be depleted again, those, those tanks. You know, I need to keep fueling them. And I, I had to go down a road of just, you know, changing my diet, changing how I look and just starting to really think about what is self-love, you know, there was no kind of guidance on how to cultivate that. And um, so I would say my, my reason um, for continuing outside of family, but my, my personal reason was I want to know the answers. I want to, I want to, I want to know what keeps these tanks full and I'll keep going to find out. And so it started with small things like changing my environment. Like I said, how I look, my hair, my diet, um, and literally piece by piece trying to create an environment that I enjoy being in. Yes. And that meant stepping away from some people, you know, it meant, um, not being so sociable. It meant being more meticulous with my work and my art. But that's the stuff that fueled me. You know, for someone else, it could be different. Many situations I wanted to quit. But there was something pulling me to keep going. It, it was like, if you don't keep going, you want to see what's on the other side. And I wanted to see what was on the other side because I felt like whatever was there, I needed it at that point. And so... That was my why. I wanted to see the end of it. And again, because of me and my personality, I'm not a quitter. So as, as much as it pained me to keep going, because, you know, when you when you're going and you are mm. moving, it gets harder. It doesn't get easier. It gets harder. And so you you're faced with so much difficulty and it, it feels like daggers and darts and everything is thrown at you, which makes you feel like. I, I'm going to just sit this one out. I felt like for me, because so many things were being thrown at me, that meant that I, I had to be at the end. I had to see the finish line because something is preventing me from going. Yeah. And there was a part of your question I didn't answer. Um, so I said, I said several times, multiple times I've been there. And so each time I got there, there was like two voices. One of them saying, you've done this before. You can do it again. And having that reference point is very, very powerful. Okay. If you know you've got through some stuff before, yes. Um, it's encouraging. Um, but then the other side to it is why do I keep getting tested with the same test? Mm -hmm. You know, and you start, you know, you start to question yourself and think, okay, I'm to blame or I'm the one that must be doing wrong. And then that's when the negative self talk starts. And I wanted to I wanted to touch on this because it feels like we are becoming more accepting of feelings and emotions. I think in certain cultures, you know, um, different demographics where you're a male or a female, if you're black or white, Asian, Hispanic, um, different cultures bring people up. They raise their kids differently. And so in some cultures, you just have to be tough. You don't talk about how you feel and you just kind of suck it up and You'll be okay, you know. Um, and while that can create like a winning and competitive mindset, when you do that too much, you then can get to an age where you don't know how to deal with emotions. And so you live in denial. And when you live in denial, you don't know you're in denial. It's like, it's like deception, you know. Um, when you're being deceived, you don't know you're being deceived until you come out of deception. It's like being asleep. When you're sleeping, you don't know you're asleep until you wake up. And so being in denial is kind of that toxic positivity, you know. You know, I can get through anything. I'm okay. I'm going to be fine. It's, everything's fine. Everything's fine. But you're never dealing with those emotions. And, and so I just kind of want to know from you, when you are in those seasons and one season is transitioning into another season, maybe you're coming out of a storm and you're about to go into some stability or your instability and you're heading into a storm. 
how important is it for us to embrace our feelings and not deny ourselves of our own truth you know whether that's the trauma that we've been through the shame the guilt all these things that we can feel how important is it for us to be accepting and embracing of those things you are allowed to be angry you are allowed to be sad you are allowed to feel what you feel because these are your emotions. Uh, you spoke about your season feels good, right? And then something comes along and it just, it's like it diminishes everything. So I've been there and I'll be honest, that fear that came over me, it's like everything was going well. You know, everything was going well and it was going well for a while. And now here's a storm. I thought I already passed over my storm. So why are we needing this now? And I remember a particular moment of that same situation and I got angry. I was like, I, I feel like I'm, I've done the work. You know, I have read the book i prepared myself but life doesn't prepare us for every facet of what it's going to give us and i remember just being angry like why am i going through these cycles but i let myself feel that i needed that i needed to be angry because i think sometimes too we when we feel like we are at a place of complacency we often don't understand that something else could happen so we 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 become complacent with ourselves our environment everything is going good and then life life again and so with that being said that anger and that hurt provided me the opportunity to sit with myself again because now this is a, a new situation and I needed to, as much as I didn't want to, face it head on. And I had to be okay with that. And it's very brave. It's very brave to do so. And I, I think sometimes, you know, and I'm going to do a chapter on this about vulnerability. Sometimes we can perceive that as being a weak thing. But it's one of the bravest things that you can do is choose to see yourself at all stages, no matter which season you're in, you know, whether you are. Um, as good as you used to be or maybe you don't look as a certain way or how you compare yourself to your old self or um, or maybe things bother you now that once upon a time they didn't bother you you know and you may feel that you've not evolved that's such an important point in just allowing yourself to feel to giving yourself permission and um, because I believe that's where the refining takes place yeah you you mentioned something that I think is so congruent to why people behave the way they are. We touched on the differences and the way that we can um, explore our feelings. So if you were um, in a family setting to where you weren't allowed to um, tell how you felt, um, you are able to share your experiences. Um, if your feelings were hurt, you were dismissed. Well, you do carry that into um, adulthood. And even on a deeper level, many times you are not able to sympathize with other people as well. You have, that has created a barrier. Not all, you can't sympathize with yourself in situations and then when it comes to people, you can't sympathize with them. I think it does come a point in everybody's life. Um where that is broken down, where we actually see ourselves for, for what it really is. And at some point, things get so hard that we have no choice but to allow ourselves to feel that emotion. If you aren't able to cry then, you're going to cry now. And you are going to let out a well. <laughs> Because it is layers and layers upon layers of things that you've been holding on to for years. And for some people, they just, it's 
the shame of actually, it's like, you ever been at a point where you knew the tears was coming and you were trying to hold, you were trying to hold it back. You were trying to just gulp it down because your mind was saying, "Uh, uh-uh, you gotta be strong, you gotta be strong. But your body was saying, release it because you need to do this. And you're fighting and you finally release and you just, you, you, you let it out, you cry. You feel all, all of the emotions. You, you feel sadness, you feel anger. Um, and for the first time you, you feel everything. And then afterwards, after you have had your crying session, <laughs> you do feel better. You do. Better. And that is where I feel like that, that lack that many people have an experience based on not being able to do so in years before, that is when it's needed. And that's when we realize it's okay to be in touch with our emotions. Absolutely. And it's quite interesting because if you think about how we are with children and how delicate we are and, you know, when a child loses a toy to them, it's the biggest thing in the world. And, and we comfort them, you know, like it is the biggest thing in the world. I'm here with you. And at some point we lose that, that empathy for self. You know, we lose that, that gentleness because we're tough on ourselves. We, we turn into that, this shouldn't be bothering me or this person shouldn't be able to upset me. We decide what our threshold should be based on how we mentally project ourselves and we judge ourselves unfairly because of that, but without considering the weight we're already carrying today and why it's harder to deal with that annoyance (laughs) or those lies or the deception, um, things that we maybe could just look over before. And so there is a part on the journey where we begin to be refined once we start to allow those feelings to happen. And as you mentioned, the crying, the tears, the salt, the purification, it's, things start to shift. Boundaries, another word that you use quite often in your work. Once you've gone through that level of pain and it doesn't break you, and you live to tell the tale, even if it's only to yourself, you look in the mirror and you see someone who got through the unthinkable, you make changes in your life and boundaries. Um, is a, there's, a, there's a heightened level of, I'm not letting that happen to me again. Yes. I'm not going to put myself in that situation again. I didn't uh. claw myself out of this wilderness only to go through the same thing again. And so we put these strict boundaries in place. And yes. um, I mentioned, you know, it's a word that you use quite often. This particular video, I think it's on your YouTube, um, where you speak about having to put those boundaries in for yourself and saying no. How important is that part of it once you come out of the seasons and the disruption and you've embraced the feelings and the emotions and you're now refining? How important is the the new you, protecting the new you. Each person has worked so hard to get to that new place. It's like you want to protect it like a baby. And you want to make sure that you are doing everything that feels good for you. So when when I speak of boundaries, that has been the hardest thing for me. That has been challenging because um, it's so easy to say yes to people and just go with the flow. Um, and I think for many people, it is disappointment that they don't want to give to other people. They've always been the yes person. And so anything that looks different, there's a possibility that you'll lose someone in the process, that they'll get upset with you and they'll cut ties with you. What I learned was when I was saying the yes is out loud, my mind was telling me, no, you don't want to do that. 
you know, it's it's more of a disruption in your life than anything. In many situations of saying, yes, I was just like, oh, I'm here for a long time. I'm around people that I, I, I don't mesh with. I'm in situations that feel so uncomfortable. You know, you have that dialogue with yourself. And um, many times I'm just like, I, sh- I should have just said no. The new me said, all right, so since we're doing everything differently <laughs> and we are requiring things, I'm, I need you to be strong and stand up for yourself now because you can't carry that old part of you into the new part of you because you want something different. So for me, it was very important that I was intentional about my no. And when I say a no, it, it's not a no because I have to do. Mm-mm. What I've learned too is that many no's don't need an explanation afterwards. Because sometimes when you give an explanation, people find a gateway. And they'll say, I said no because of this, but the next time I'll ask. And then you have to come up with another no because... My no is just my no. And as soon as I started to practice that, as soon as I started to say them out loud, um, I felt powerful because it was something new. And I was able to actually audibly say it and be stirring with love in my voice. And people got it. And then even some, you know, some scenarios, it was, I was so afraid to say no, but people were like, oh, that's fine. (laughs) It's fine. I think it's what we created in our mind as well. And then there were people who had, you know, issues with it and, um, and that's fine too. But then I think that that part of it is understanding also where your place was in their lives and that, that yes gave them opportunity to use you in a way and the moment you say no they don't need you anymore so that answers the question as well where your placement was in some people's lives you think about these seasons and i said them quite chronologically but sometimes the seasons overlap oh yes sometimes you're healing and you're refining and you're going through the wilderness all at the same time and um other people are not on your timeline. They're not in sync with you. And so what you might require in this season, they may not be able to give you. Because they may need to pull from you, but your cup may be empty. And so it's about having those clear boundaries so you can identify, okay, who can I really depend upon in my life? You know, who who can I rely upon to check in on me you know because if you start putting those responsibilities in the wrong people you end up feeling lonely here's something that i learned i want to piggyback on that here's something that i learned in my personal life i was going through a really tough time everybody is different i don't lean on people i kind of uh move back um, and it was a personal thing that I really needed to work out with myself. Like I, I, no one could help me. And I had a close friend and we would talk every day and, um, we went a week without talking and she called me and she was like, I'm just checking on you. I haven't heard from you. We normally have these talks and without telling her exactly what was going on, um, I told her, hey, you know, I'm I'm really going through something right now. And um, I just need, you know, a moment. And she understood initially. Um, so to keep the communication, because at that point, like, I wasn't in the headspace to talk on the phone because we would talk at length. And I text her, you know, checking on you just to let her know, like, I'm still in the midst of what I'm going through. I'm still here. And um, it was good for a while. And then she called me and we, I, I felt like because of our friendship, like I owed her, you know, this conversation because I was distant, you know. And um, so, you know, we had a, a long, lengthy conversation and she began to ask me personal questions about this situation. 
and I didn't feel comfortable. Although she was my friend, she wasn't my best friend. You know, she was a close friend. And, um, you know, in a nice way, I just let her know it's it's very complicated, um, but I'm, I'm going to be okay. Um, she took it very personally. And she didn't check up on me. She didn't call me. I remember texting. I would text back in the morning. She would text in late at night. We're responding with shortness. And I remember feeling maybe I did something wrong. You know, you got to check you too, right? So I was like, maybe, you know, because this is different. This is a different part of me. She hasn't seen this part. So maybe, you know, it's me. So it was, again, me trying to engage, calling. She wouldn't call me back. And I realized in that moment that sometimes people only value you or want you around when it's familiar to them and when you're going through something and they can't, number one, get insight into the very depths of your life. They feel a certain type of way. Um, number two, I realized after, and this was like, I think almost a year after I, I had a conversation with a friend. I wasn't talking about her, but she came up. And my other friend was going through something and she ran. She did her the same way. And many times the people that we feel understand don't understand. That may be a personal thing on their part or it just may be us. But I don't need friends that can be there through all season. And I also understand that people will have their seasons as well. So if you communicate with me that it's something going on, I'm going to make it my mission to check on you, but I'm going to give you your space. I realize that um, sometimes people want what they want, and when they can't get it, they let you go. That's such an important point, though. You know, we are all so different, and we are in different spaces. And, you know, what you said there is about identifying the patterns as well. It's, you know... Sometimes I think we forget how people do us. And because we don't want to be alone, we allow part-time people into a space that needs full-time care. Mm, come on. Once you've got through the seasons and you start refining and you start embracing your, your feelings, you get more clarity um the boundaries that you set you become quite aware of the kinds of people you need in your life and so you know today's topic um is cultivating space for healing and self-love and so so far we've gone in this journey and um, that i'm sure a lot of people can identify with the wilderness this changing of seasons the overlapping of seasons the that refining process um but the healing Ooh, it's such a huge topic. How important is it for us to cultivate space for ourselves to heal and also give ourselves that the level of self-love mm. that can potentially take us through the next wilderness that may not be far away? You know, I'm, I'm an advocate for healing. But I'm also aware that you can't push a person into healing. It is something that they have to feel and want for themselves. I think so many people are broken in their own way. Um, and just moving and living along as if nothing happened. There will be a moment that comes I just feel like it for everyone where something will surface, something will trigger, something will remind you of the parts that are broken. And it is what you do in that process, whether you decide to keep going and, and, and ignoring them and, and make the problem bigger. I always, when I think about that, I think about, um, I think about a, a rubber band ball, right? You know how you make the balls with the rubber band? 
and you keep putting more and more and it becomes bigger and bigger. At some point, it'll become so big that it'll become bigger than your hand and you can't hold it. When it gets to that point, that means you have lots of things to work through. At some point, you're going to have to face the things that you have gone through, um, the things that you are feeling, and you're going to have to be honest with yourself throughout your healing as well. I think when people think of healing, they think something happened. I'm going to sit with it for a minute. You know, I'm going to figure this thing out and then I'm healed. No, ma'am. No, sir. It doesn't work like that. It is a process. And in that healing process as well, you will learn so much about yourself. Even the way that you operate in situations, whether you ignore them or face them head on, you'll start undoing something. And then wrap up in healing as well is what you mentioned, self-love. Often, the reason why we bypass a lot of things and we keep going is because we don't really love and honor ourselves. So that encompasses the part of healing as well. It wasn't until I healed in many situations where I really started to love me. Because if I have to be honest, I was uh, ignoring some of the, the things that I saw. And I wasn't ready to face some of the truths as well. You know, that, that toxic positivity that we often hear about. Oh, it's going to be okay. It's good. And then I hit the wall and I was like, this is not okay. Now I'm going to have to deal with it. Because for me, I want to show up differently. I want to be a different person. I don't want to keep saying that everything is okay and I'm in a mess. The sooner that you allow it to just be what it be, the sooner that you see it for what it is, it's the sooner that you see yourself as well. Because, you know, self-accountability is one of those things too that we don't like to do. We don't like to take an assessment of ourselves. We don't like to look in the mirror. We don't like to uh, call out all of the things that we've done and that we've taken part in. That is the part of growing. That is the part of growing. And that incorporates in the healing as well. And then I always feel like when we come into that healing journey and we're moving out because there are phases of it, it's, it's different facets, different things that you're going to heal from. You'll begin to love yourself more because now you appreciate yourself. You've dug deep. You've seen so many aspects of yourself. You realize why you get angry so quickly. You realize you can't... Um, why it's hard for you to love, why it's hard for you to take compliments, why it's hard for you to stay in relationships, <laughs> you know, why is it hard for um, you to deal with criticism when it's actually constructive criticism, you know, when we undo those things and really face ourselves head on, that is when we self-appreciate and then we self-love. And then after that, it's, Still taking different parts because we'll never be perfect, right? Even though I mastered this, there's something else that's going to come through. And guess what? Because I've been through the process, it's not that hard now. The, the hardest step is actually doing it the first time because you don't know what it looks like and you don't know what it feels like and you don't know where to begin. So I really feel like healing encompasses so much more than just the title of healing you'll come out with so much more than you thought you would have and self-love is definitely one um that you'll acquire in that healing journey you know i want to add to the analogy of that elastic band that that rubber band ball so not only will it get too big for your hand but there's also going to become a point where you don't have an elastic big enough to to add another layer uh, to add another mask because at some point it's going to snap mm, we, we can call yeah. that in our lives like a breaking point and so what we want to do is start to unravel it come on every single elastic is important 
And so what sometimes what we do is we might just try and grab a few off at the same time and just pretend there's not that many. Yes. But at each layer of that that ball as it's grown as big as it has, there's traumas, you know, there's vulnerabilities, there's 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 scabs, there's 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 wounds, there's bruises that we can see, there's bruises that we can't see, you know, and this is why it's so essential when we are unpacking and offloading, even like be mindful of how you offload is you have to do it with gentleness and and self-love because if you start ripping those elastics, the whole thing can just, you know, break apart. One of the things we struggle with, or a lot of people struggle with, is knowing how to be kind to themselves. I think it's so important for us to reframe how we view healing um, because although you have to go through some painful steps along that process, it's such a beautiful journey. Oh, yes. Um, when you're present in it. Again, your work, it puts out this energy of, it just feels so earthy and so pure and so organic. And so can you share some of the things that you've done I guess, environmentally or just changes you've made in your own life um, to cultivate that space for you to lean into that place of where like self-care and therapeutic energy and good vibes is your domain. Like what are some of the things you've done that maybe some of our listeners can start to do maybe a few hobbies or um, things that you've used as therapy? Well, I I love my plants. I'm looking at yours, but <laughs> I love my plants. I, you know, plants for me, they are a form of peace. I talk to my plants. I thoroughly enjoy them. There is something beautiful about their living and something beautiful about seeing how it stretches to the sun and seeing the transition when they're not, when they're a little sick, you know, when they need a little water and they perk back up. Surrounding my environment with my plants gives me so much peace. Um, and it also calms me. So with that being said, and I know it's different for everybody else, but that's, that is my cohesive place. That is my calming space. Whenever I am writing or even creating or um, even speaking, for me as a person, it was better for me to take information from someone who felt like a hug, who felt like their words were endearing, not someone who was very boastful and loud. And again, everybody's different. I'm in the U.S. and I'm in the South. So we have the aunties and the grandmothers who would, hey, baby, come here. Let me talk to you for a minute. Let me sit you down. And they sit you down face to face and they'll hold your hand. And whatever you were struggling with, they didn't make you feel like you were damaged. But they let you know, been there, done that, and it's okay. And let me walk you through it. And then after that, and, and they'll come to you in harshness, but they'll come to you in love. It was always wrapped in love. And so that part of it felt so soothing because you were being chastised, but you was being loved as well. And you got the message better than someone screaming at you and saying, you did this, don't do that. You know, it's it's the way that you hear it in the ears and that you receive it in your mind and in your body. And so for me, that is just, that's where I am. And I'm a mother, you know, and that is the way that I talk to my kids. I'm not a screamer. I'm not a holler. It's okay. Let's, let's, let's sit down. Let's have a one-on-one. -on -one. Let's talk about this because I want to talk to you in love. I want to talk to you. You didn't do that right, but guess what? I still love you. I'm going to hold your hand, but this is where I'm coming from. And my boys have told me time and time again, I have a 20 year old, I have an 18 year old and I have a 14 year old. My two oldest sons always say to me 
and they they tell their their friends as well and even their friends tell me i appreciate that in the time that i did something opposite of what you told me to do you still loved me and you gave me grace you still chastised me but you didn't make me feel this small and i think for so many people when you are faced with something we don't like to hear, no one likes to hear that they did something wrong. I mean, that's just who we are. But if you could just pillow it just a little bit with a little bit of love and a little bit of grace and a little bit of understanding, people will be receptive of the fact that you're telling them for their own good and they just, they want to see you do well and then go off as well. You know, harshness has its place loudness definitely has its place but for me um i love in grace and i love with hugs and i think that's so important and so you know i mentioned earlier easier said than done but those two things are are very easy things to do you know so one was external and that was you know plants it's an environmental thing that makes you feel good and so surrounding yourself with things that make you feel good, that match the energy that you want to experience. Um, and then the other one is more internal, you know, having the self-awareness to say, actually, I want to, I'm a, I'm a gentle person. So I want to consume gentle content. It's all the little tiny things, you know, when you put them together, that creates what some will look at our work and say, oh, it's just an aesthetic. It's an Instagram filter, you know, um, but that's your life right and and so you know you can only imagine like what your home looks like and then what your your working space looks like and what your garden looks like you can only imagine based on what you've seen um how that flows into other areas of your life you know the kind of things that you wear the kind of people you're around and then the type of spaces that affords you um, and then the opportunities that come from you being in a therapeutic space. Um, now you're getting information that you wouldn't have had access to before. You're now you're learning about diet and um, holistic living and, and you know, the, the connection between plants and people. And now you start caring about animals and now you just start looking at, you just go down a completely different path of awakening compared to the stressful one that we spoke about in the beginning and so you mentioned it um you you want to receive your content um like those those aunties down south and but that's what you do you've made it quite clear you give vocal hugs okay and so if you would i want you to envision a person right now who who's really going through it um, maybe they are where we started at the beginning of this conversation, right in the middle of the wilderness. Maybe they have mental health difficulties. They struggle with depression, anxiety. Maybe they have suicidal thoughts. Maybe they've lost people close to them. A mother, a daughter, a son, a father. Maybe they've gone through abuse in their life, childhood. Maybe they're going through domestic violence now. Maybe they're a victim of bullying or Maybe they're not sure about their sexuality or identity or even their own race, the color of their skin. Maybe they've never felt a sense of belonging. They desire to step into that space that you've spoken of today, that place that feels light and a place where they don't have to keep putting those elastic bands around and around and they can get to the core of who they are. But it doesn't feel that way to them. If you could... Could you end this chapter today by giving that person or those people one of your iconic vocal hugs? You are in this space, space of so much confusion, so many things that are going on. And I want to remind you that life will be what it is. You may not have the answers, and I'm not asking you to have the answers right now, but I want you to take your time in this moment. Feel what you feel. Be where you are. But still in that moment, I also want you to see yourself in a better space. Sometimes when we are stuck, we feel as if we don't have a moment to 
move. We don't have a moment to feel. We don't have a moment to embrace a change. I want you to know that there will always be difficulty, but through difficulty, there's always success as well. And whatever you are challenged with, whatever you are going through, I promise it will be okay. I can't guarantee that every day after today and tomorrow will be the same. But what I do know consistently is that everything will work out for its good. For my self to you, I, I feel the pain that you feel. Many of us have been there and it's going to be okay. I wish to extend this love and this hug to you because you deserve it. From energy to energy, from the feeling of vocal love, the, the feeling of an, an invisible touch, I'm here. We're all here. You are not lonely. You are surrounded by people who live circumstances similar to yours. It will be okay. You will survive. You are strong. You are beautiful. You are you. You are going to be okay. With lots of love, lots of hugs, lots of being. I do wish you well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Such a beautiful way to end a beautiful chapter. Um, I hope that you all listening have been touched today and that you you feel, even if it's incremental, a little more hope that it's possible. You're, you're listening to two people who have been through it, are going through it. You know, this is a this is a continual journey of peaks and valleys and mountain tops and wildernesses. And somewhere in the middle, that gray area, we're all here trying to navigate and find some calm and peace. And so I, I just encourage you all to please listen to the works of Lisa Marie. There's so much wisdom and so much comfort that you can use to pull on daily to, until you pull yourself through. Um, but it's also great content for you if you are in the middle of the refining or the healing process. And I, I just pray and hope that you emerge victorious from whatever you are going through right now. Um, I thank you for everything you've shared today. It's been a pleasure to speak about such important things. Thank you so much. I felt the warmth, I felt the love, and it was a great conversation. That concludes another chapter of The Crown podcast. For more information on my guest, Lisa Marie, check out the links in the description. And until next time, stay blessed and I wish you better days.